Gabe DiBenedetti is a national correspondent for New York Magazine. He is in Washington. And Dave Weigel is a national political correspondent for the Washington Post, also in Washington. All right, gentlemen, let's start uh, with this question. President Trump said that he nominated Neil Gorsuch because he shared similar qualities with the late Justice Antonin Scalia, whom he replaced. Given the power of Supreme Court rulings to affect Americans' lives, pretty safe to assume, you think, Gabe, that the president will nominate someone with unmistakably conservative credentials. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Go ahead, yeah, Gabe. I mean, yeah. I, absolutely. There doesn't seem to be any doubt whatsoever that he's going to go in a fairly conservative direction here. You're seeing it already with the shortlist and with some other names that are being uh, talked about. He obviously has gotten a ton of praise from uh, people across the conservative world, including a number of Republican senators, for his choice of Neil Gorsuch, who, of course, is a very conservative uh, jurist. No reason to believe that he's going to go in a more moderate direction here, particularly because, as we keep hearing, it's likely not going to be all that difficult for Republicans to uh, confirm someone when it actually comes down, comes time to do that. So, sure, go as far right as possible in, in, in the thinking of some of the people in the White House. And, and Dave, put this in perspective for us. The Supreme Court was one major justification for Republicans who decided to vote for President Trump in 2016. How significant is a second nomination for Supreme Court justice for President Trump's legacy? For, for his legacy? Well, it's... It's something that Democrats uh, have had nightmares about literally every moment since they lost the 2016 election. Uh, I would add to what Gabe was saying in that uh, in the past, and th let's start this past in the 80s, candidates for president would run and saying, we don't have an ideological test. We want judges who follow the, con the Constitution, who are originalists. Even Democrats would say they believe in a living Constitution, but they didn't say, here's my list of nominees. What, the, what, tr what Trump did in 2016, because he needed to convince evangelicals who were skeptical to vote for him has said, I will literally outsource my court nominees to the Federal Society. Mm -hmm. I will pick from this list of names. They're all conservative. You know who they are. So he's removed a lot of the mystery. Uh, you're never going to see a David Souter, I would say, again. You're never going to mm -hmm. see a dark horse pick. Uh, I'm, I, Souter, I should point out, was appointed when there was a Republican president and Democratic Senate. Uh, but no, this is ideological warfare. Democrats have no tools to stop it. The only way they can stop it is if uh, there's a nominee so unqualified that some pro-choice Republicans decide to oppose him or her. That's unlikely, again, because we have this list. So as battles for the future of uh, the bench go. This is not very suspenseful. Hmm. Well, also joining us now, Sabrina Siddiqui, a CBSN political contributor and political reporter for The Guardian. Um, Sabrina, we all remember President Obama's pick to replace Justice Scalia did not get a hearing. Here is how Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell justified that back in 2016. The next justice could fundamentally alter the direction of the Supreme Court and have a profound impact on our country. So, of course, of course, the American people should have a say in the court's direction. It is the President's constitutional right to nominate a Supreme Court justice, and it is the Senate's constitutional right to act as a check on a President and withhold its consent. It seems clear that President Obama made this nomination not, not with the intent of seeing the nominee confirmed, but in order to politicize it for purposes of the election. So on Wednesday, McConnell said they will have a hearing on Kennedy's replacement this fall. It is an election year this year as well. Sabrina, is this case much different? Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has argued that a presidential election year is not the same as a midterm election year, but you are hearing Democrats put forth a number of counter arguments. One they say they have said is that if it was up to the voters to make their voices heard at the ballot box in terms of uh, which party gets to appoint a Supreme Court nominee through uh, the presidency, then similarly you can make the case that voters should be heard in terms of deciding uh, which party should control majority of the Senate, which, of course, has the power to confirm a Supreme Court uh, nominee. I, I think that argument will fall on deaf ears when it comes to Republicans who have already indicated, as you said, that they will move forward expeditiously when they receive a nomination. But I think you also see Democrats saying, look, Mitch McConnell and Republicans broke from the norms, uh, first by not giving Merrick Garling a hearing or a vote, but also by changing the rules so that they can confirm a Supreme Court justice or nominee with just a simple majority vote. So they don't feel that they have to abide by any norms themselves. If 
So I, they don't have a lot of tools, as Dave said, uh, to stop this nominee, nomination from moving forward. So they will really just try and use this, I think, as a galvanizing issue moving ahead, looking into the 2018 midterm elections. Gabe, let me ask you, you recently wrote about former President Obama, who has been out of the spotlight since President Trump took office. Do you think we will see him address this at all? Well, actually, this is an exact example of something that President Obama is unlikely to speak out about. He really is very hesitant these days to wade into the day-to-day -day political fight. And, of course, he is engaged in some long-term projects. But this is, as we've all talked about now, something that seems pretty straightforward what's going to actually happen. So it's not as if President Obama can actually affect this conversation, which speaks to the broader problem that Democrats have right now. Without any power on Capitol Hill to stop this and without really much of the national bully pulpit on their side uh, or or at their fingertips they're not going to be able to turn this into a major outrage for the for the public in any way that has real uh, ramifications for how the vote is going to turn out unless there's some sort of surprise here so Democrats are sort of just left wondering what exactly they're going to be able to do with this except for try and uh, turn up their turnout uh, with the midterms but of course again as we've all been hearing now this is likely to happen before the midterms even reach us so Dave um, you, you had Senator Dianne Feinstein saying the Senate should follow the McConnell standard. But given what you all have laid out here, that Democrats are essentially powerless to stop this, what would you expect Democrats to do? What would you expect to see from them, nevertheless, uh, as they look at this nomination proceeding forward? Well, Democrats care a bit more than Republicans about winning the argument in, in, frankly, the D.C. press corps. I think that's what's going on today. They want it out there. They want it part of the conversation that Republicans set up some rules, and then as soon as they became inconvenient, they abandoned them. That keeps happening. I'm not sure they've gotten a lot of credit for it, but that's, that's their argument today. I think what you'll see as elections approach, now we set this up saying there'll probably be a judge confirmed in, uh, by, the, by the start of October. If there's one thing we know about this era, people forget news that happened six hours earlier. So this might fade as an issue ahead of the election. Uh, but what they're going to focus on is issues where a swing vote uh, uh, for the conservatives would be unpopular. So Republicans in, for example, Montana want to make this about uh, gun rights cases. What Democrats are going to say is, do you want a judge who's going to rule to undo the Affordable uh, Care Act and its protections? Do you want a judge who's going to ban abortion? Do you want a judge who's going to undo gay marriage, which is now basically a 70 percent popular issue, popular even in red states? So I think if they find their political footing, it'll be a, this is a political fight. We admit it now. Uh, we should, everyone should admit it. And this is about a judge who's going to rule against the things you care about. That's what they didn't do in 2016. And s some Democrats, not all, realize that was a mistake. Um, Sabrina, let me ask you a question about political capital here. How much does this situation now boost Senator Mitch McConnell's status, considering it was his maneuvering in 2016 that essentially led to this particular point of a second nomination now being available to this president? Well, I think that it certainly helps uh, Senator Mitch McConnell position himself uh, in terms of he's not someone who's been viewed as particularly vulnerable, but in terms of making the case that his gambit uh, to not give Merrick Garland a hearing or a vote, uh, that, it, that it was effective in 2016. Of course, then you mentioned the rules change that uh, by and large paid off for Republicans. I think it, it, you, will, you will see more broadly as Republicans argue that for all of the areas where they disagree with uh, President Trump, with whether it's his tone or his proposed policies, that this is the reason why uh, they must, one, continue to support him and his agenda, but also, two, uh, why voters should continue and uh, cast their ballots for Republicans down ballot. Uh, so it's, it's galvanizing, though, for both sides. I think Dave also alluded to the flip side of this, which is that although Democrats are fairly powerless in stopping this uh, nominee from moving forward, uh, they will very much frame this as an, a, a potential assault on LGBT rights, on immigrant rights, uh, on access access to abortion, uh, on uh, upholding the pre President Obama's health care law, uh, labor unions, and you've already had a number of consequential decisions uh, that help them tee up that argument. And it's not just about this one uh, vacancy, which will already be dealt with by the 2018 midterms. It will also be about a potential third vacancy and, and the long-term ramifications of President Trump having not one, not two, but perhaps even more uh, positions that he is able to fill in the Supreme Court. Uh, for a long time, Republicans have had the the upper hand in this fight. So this will be a really interesting turning point potentially to see if Democrats can get their base to care as much about the judiciary as Republicans have with conservatives. And Gabe, let me ask you, how are Democrats who might be thinking of running in 2020 reacting to Kennedy's retirement? 
Well, there's an obvious opportunity here if this is going to turn into a dragged out fight, which is possible if the president does uh, choose someone who's not from the mainstream, then this will turn into a big political fight. Then there's an opportunity for the folks who are running in 2020 or who are looking at running in 2020 from the Senate to turn this into a fight that has their name stamped all over it. They will try and use whatever mechanisms they can to put pressure on not only their own colleagues who may be thinking about voting for, uh, for the eventual nominee, but on Republicans who are uh, wavering themselves. So this is a chance for someone potentially to break out. But a lot of them may also be making the calculation that if we think this thing is going to go away rather quickly without much of a fight, maybe they shouldn't step up. Maybe they shouldn't try and stake their name here because, of course, they're likely not going to win this one. What are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, we've heard this uh, being discussed during the Trump presidency that there's been sort of a reigniting of the culture wars uh, under the Trump administration. What is your thought now as we look at the situation where President Trump has the ability now potentially uh, to shift the court, uh, as Jan Crawford said, you know, more solidly to the right for generation here? It's not as if Donald Trump did have a broad mandate from all over the country uh, to to really change the culture and change the way that the United States functions in terms of its, uh, its certainly its judicial branch. But the reality here is that he does have the possibility, if we do see more retirements, to change one of the three branches of, of government at the top, at least, for generations to come. And that could really have enormous uh, repercussion, repercussions, even as he remains pretty unpopular, even as a lot of the country really disagrees with a lot of his for more conservative points. And of course, you know, as we know, he has been working to remake the judiciary up and down uh, the, the judiciary itself. It's not just the Supreme Court, it's judges all over the country. Uh, and some of these people will be around and ruling for decades to come. Right. And President Trump has taken every opportunity he can when he connects with those voters, when he goes out on those campaign uh, rallies, right. to remind people of that fact. Gabe DiBenedetti, Sabrina Siddiqui, and Dave Weigel, wherever you are, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much.